This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Spencer Brudig. I'm Will Johnson. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. It's just a crazy story of horrific, horrific things that happened in this so-called house of prayer when really at the end of the day, it was everything but that. Earlier this year, Jocelyn Howard, a reporter at First Coast News in Jacksonville, Florida, took a trip to meet with someone who wanted to tell her story, a story of abuse and survival that took place decades ago. And I don't want to say um, the specific person's name, but I will say that I had an interview lined up with someone that was a survivor and um, very impactful story. And I was very eager to have this a part of my um, story because we talked on the phone and they were very descriptive of what happened. And I drove hours to go see them um, and everything seemed fine and they showed up. And then the second that I turned away, they were gone. And I called and said, hey, I lost you. What happened? And um, they said, oh, you know, I had to go to work. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were under a time constraint. Um, is there, can we find another time to do it? And they said, I, I just, I can't tell this story. I'm sorry, I can't tell it. And that's what really got me is this, you know, we planned this for like two weeks. They were completely okay with it. But all of these decades later, it shows the pain that these adults are still going through. And it still seems fresh to them. And I think that's very telling. You know, you think of like a 40-some-year-old adult, and you just don't think of them kind of running out on an interview. And it just shows the pain that they are going through. And of course, at that point, I didn't push anything further because I didn't want to be a part of, you know, messing up that healing process that obviously is still going on. But others have also come forward to tell their story and recall what happened and to open doors into a past that is so awful they still have scars, emotional and physical. It's a story that centers around a house in Florida, but then winds to Illinois, back to Florida, and then to Georgia. That's where Paolo Suro, a reporter at WXIA in Atlanta, would first hear about the House of Prayer. It's such a strange case. It's almost one of those that you read and you, you don't believe everything that happened. Uh, so this House of Prayer, it was opened in the early 1980s in a town south of uh, Gainesville, Florida, by this woman named Anna Elizabeth Young. So what would happen is families would come in and drop off their children in this home, thinking their kids were attending a religious boarding school, um, you know, this house of prayer. But in reality, it was everything but that. Um, you know, in reality, a lot of these children, these kids were being tortured and abused in many ways by Anna Young. Uh, some were being hit with extension cords. Some, if not all, were starved, um, you know, locked in these rooms that you couldn't see. These, these rooms were hidden. Um, others were even given chemical baths. Um, our station actually interviewed uh, back in 2017 the sister of one of these girls who was given that chemical bath. Um, and, and the photos are just horrific. As it turns out, Anna Young's house of prayer wasn't just a place for children. In many cases, parents would also live there as well with their children. Not so much a boarding school, but something else altogether. That's where the line is very blurry. And um, because they call it Christian boarding school, but a lot of adults were on the property and kind of what could have made it look like a boarding school is um, the children were separated from their parents um, because Anna wanted to have that hold on both the parents and the kids that, you know, she's mother Anna. And also, you know, whenever a kid's not with their parents, you know, they're, they're probably more apt to listen to Anna. Um, and, you know, the parents also aren't watching their kids necessarily getting beaten in the same way they might not have this same connection to them. So because of that, all the kids were grouped and it could look like, I'm guessing to people, a boarding school. Now, there were some kids there that didn't have their parents, but honestly, I, I think more so the parents were there. But young or old, Anna Young had a hold on the minds of her followers that led them down dark paths and allowed them to believe her and follow her will in a way that now, as Jocelyn Howard has learned, seems unimaginable to them. They were in tears, and it wasn't only because of what they saw, but maybe what they did too. Um, that now they, they just didn't know any better at the time because they were so under her spell. Or as one survivor, John Neal, recently told Jocelyn, the idea of leaving the house of prayer back then was hardly an option. And one thing that John told me as well, he was a child at the time, but he didn't see this as, you know, oh, if I leave the property, you know, then I'll be without church. It was, I leave the property and I go to hell. And so these people, you know, they thought Anna had, you know, was the voice of God. And um, if they left, you know, they didn't have salvation. And that just, I mean, it breaks my heart. And it just shows, you know, of course, they would kind of go through with some of these things that were not necessarily of the world um, because they believed that the, their salvation was on the line. It's why the House of Prayer can now be considered a cult, with members under the ether of a woman capable of cajoling her followers to mete out horrible torture and abuse, not just to others, but to themselves. One particularly horrific story has to do with John Neal's mother and her partner at the time. John's mother and another man on the property were were married. I'm not sure if it was legal or not, but in Anna's eyes, they were married. And Anna, for some reason, ordered them not to have sex. And they did anyways. And Anna ordered the man to chop his penis off. And it wasn't a thing where they held him down to do it. He went out to a shed, iced it, 
and chopped it off himself. And I think that is extremely telling of this grasp that Anna had on these people, children and adults. Um, and I think for the children, it was more out of fear. For the adults, it was a little out of fear, but it was also their, you know, salvation. Their salvation was on the line. And punishment at the House of Prayer included deprivation, extreme deprivation that can only be described as torture. She had these areas in the home with hidden rooms where she could put these kids that were being tortured in case, you know, anyone ever showed up, like police, for example. She was able to hide these people successfully because this house had these hidden rooms. Um, and you see the videos and the photos of these rooms, and they're tiny, tiny, tiny boxes where these, you know, kids were put in. Jocelyn Howard has also heard extensive stories about these hiding places or torture rooms. For children and adults, they would both be locked away. There is this one space that I didn't get to see on the property because it's no longer there. Um, I hear it described as what was a tractor trailer without the truck end, just kind of the trailer. Um, and in the Florida sun, it is so hot here. And it was um, kind of almost like a torture chamber in a way that they would leave people in there for days with no food or water and it was hot in there. And so that was what I hear. A lot of adults would be punished in that space. Um, kids would be punished in um, closets and not all of the spaces were used for torture. Um, they were used to hide John Neal. And there was a space, I'm trying to think whenever I was walking through the house, there's a space that you kind of open up the floorboard and maybe just a foot off the ground is how much room John would have when he would go into that space. There were spaces um, in sheds that were hidden um, that you kind of move a piece of the wall and all of a sudden there's a space between the two walls and the shed. Um, a few different spots, but basically it was a, a skin infection that took John Neal to the hospital. And in that um, encounter, the doctor noticed the scars on his back, part of his ear missing, just extreme child abuse. And um, that's when the doctor alerted authorities, hey, we have to take a look at this house of prayer. And from there, obviously, Anna and the adult members knew that the authorities would be coming here and there and whenever they'd see the authorities coming. And I mean, this is a dirt road. You know, you can see when people are coming, the dust is everywhere. You can hear it. And um, they would scream, Bilal. And Bilal means the devil. And when that happens, John would run to these spaces and stay in there. But nobody would necessarily tell him when to come out. Um, whether, you know, it could, I think, Joyce, they'd be like all night. Um, but I mean, those spaces, there's certain spaces to hide John. And there's certain spaces that were for punishment or torture and and um, those spaces that weren't for John Neal, those punishment spaces, usually that's where they would be starved in there for days, starved in no water for days. Police actually went to the house to see what the situation was like. And during that time, Anna Young knew this, knew that police were coming or she could hear them or see them. And she put a lot of, um, she put the, these kids that maybe looked like they were starved or, or not doing well, or you could see, you know, the marks on their body. She hid them in these boxes. And so police came in and just feet away, you know, there are these the children who are starved or, or not doing well. And they didn't notice because the, they're hidden in this box. So it's crazy, you know, that it, law enforcement was able to walk in there and, and not notice anything um, at that time. So not, nothing out of the ordinary, I should say, um, but really a lot, you know, it was a very dark, dark place. Anna Young's daughter, Joy Fluker, recalls the young John Neal being placed in one of these compartments and forgotten. The hidden compartments at the farm, you know, those weren't necessarily punishment areas. Those were areas built to hide John Neal when, you know, the police was trying to look for him. So we would have to scream out, Bilal, when everyone came to the property, which means the devil, and he would go hide in those spaces. But sometimes, even when they left, no one would just let him right out. they just let him stay there and he'd be in there, you know, underneath the floorboards of the house, hidden compartments, tiny little spaces. But these stories and so many others like them also stayed hidden. And in at least two cases, the stories ended in death, the deaths of two young children. Unbelievably, that's not what ended Anna Young's reign at the House of Prayer. It was other charges. Uh, but, you know, this House of Prayer that began in the 80s, its downfall started in 1992, uh, when Young was actually charged with felony child abuse. Um, and those charges came from when uh, she actually gave a chemical bath to that girl I was referring to, the sister that we interviewed. Um, Nikki Nicholson was her name. So Anna Young put her, this Nikki, put Nikki in a chemical bath. Uh, police said it was a mix of bleach, ammonia, um, other chemicals, and they ended up giving her third degree burns, especially on her legs, so much so that Nikki had actually uh, had to she had to relearn relearn how to walk um, so she had to go through all of that and because of that she was charged um, with felony child abuse but what's crazy is the story just keeps keeps getting crazier um, Anna Young actually fled the state when she was charged with that and she fled to Illinois where she was found eight years later um, at a relative's house she was found because she was on the FBI's most wanted list um, so she's arrested in 2001 and charged with felony child abuse and extradited back to Florida. Um, and that's where she spends about six months in prison. I believe it was 190 days or so. But that was it. Anna Young was soon free to live life on the outside. 
and the terrible crime she'd committed at the House of Prayer would have gone untold and unpunished if it weren't for survivors coming forward many years later, and one person in particular. The person who ended up turning Anna Young in again was her daughter, Joy Fluker, who was there when it all happened. Uh, Joy Fluker called police in 2016 to talk about what happened, and Young was arrested a year later here in Marietta, Georgia. So she was charged with murdering two toddlers. Um, their names, Iman, Mo they called him Moses, Harper, and Katonia Jackson in the 1980s. One of our top stories, an ex-cult leader accused of murdering two toddlers found guilty in court today. Anna Young pleaded no contest to char charges of murder and manslaughter for crimes dating back to the 1980s. A judge sentencing her to 30 years in prison. I'm sure it's also bittersweet for Joy Fluker because she's the one who turned in her mom, but um, it's something that she's been dealing with, it sounds like, for a very long time and needed to speak out. It was an emotional day in court today as survivors of the former Alachua County cult, the House of Prayer for All People, watched a woman who they trusted and feared receive the punishment they say she deserved. You can't sweep a child's life or any human life innocent life under the rug. John Neal, Katanya's brother and a former child victim of Anna Young, addressed her in court today for the first time in decades. Katanya was an exceptional little girl. She was beautiful. Anna Young's daughter gave many other cult survivors the courage to come forward about Young's crimes. Some of the Lachua County Sheriff's Office say this is the most shocking case that they've ever handled. I mean, Joy went to the extent of saying that she remembers the beatings, the whippings, the starvation, and the people being locked in these boxes and forced to eat cow manure. So. It is just a lot of horrific things that happened within those doors. In Florida, Jocelyn Howard would eventually learn extensive details about the two deaths that we know of that happened in the House of Prayer. One was John Neal's younger sister, Catania. John and his sister, Catania, and their mother came to the property. John was about, I want to say, eight years old. Catania was about two. And there was something about Catania that Anna, for some reason, um, just saw that she had a demon inside of her. And because of that, um, she Anna would have other members or um, even the children beat Catania. Catania at the time was a toddler, about two years old. And um, she would make, Anna would make Catania run in circles. And um, if Catania got tired or stopped, she would have, she or would have other kids hit her with sticks to make her keep running. So out of this, you know, being exhausted and being beaten, Catania eventually developed a, a seizure disorder. And um, that's how Catania ultimately died, is that she um, had a seizure, went to Shan's Hospital, which is in Gainesville, and um, died at the hospital there. Now, this is where you can see kind of the hold that Anna had on not just the kids, but the adults, the families. For some reason, um, Catania's death certificate has Anna's name on it. Anna was at the hospital. Catania's actual mom, who was John's mom also, didn't know that Catania was at the hospital at the time. Catania was buried before the mom knew that Catania actually died. Um, buried in an unmarked grave outside Micanope. And she, um, you know, that was kind of the end. And they saw it as she had a demon inside of her and not much after that. Now, um, the, you know, doctors were suspicious because saw, um, you know, some alarming things on Catania as well. But I don't believe that led to an investigation yet. Years later, when John and Anna's daughter, Joy Fluker, and others came forward, that case would be one of the two that would put Anna Young behind bars. John Neal himself would escape his younger sister's fate, but not without lifelong scars. He had to get 30 lashes um, with, a, with an extension cord. And that extension cord tore off part of his ear. Um, it was over a long period of time because they wouldn't let it finish until he was standing up straight. He, and this, he was just, you know, I want to say he was 10 years old at this point. He was very young. And that that beating, that specific beating, left scars on him to this day. There's pictures from um, the investigation showing, you know, this grown man now who's in his 40s who has these lashes all over his back and his arms. And, I mean, that just shows, you know, as a kid, you know, you would think you kind of grow out of your scars a little bit sometimes, and it's so prominent. So John Neal definitely is a case where you can see the evidence of what happened to him emotionally um, when it comes to his sister, and of course being beaten, and then maybe some mistrust with his mom because his mom, you know, was inside this and following Anna's orders. But um, they ended up leaving, I want to say in the early 90s, whenever the House of Prayer kind of fell apart. The other case that put Anna Young behind bars involved another young child, Iman Harper. It's a nightmarish memory of abuse that Joy Fluker would eventually share with Jocelyn as well, years after Anna's sentencing. She would make him fast, you know, like all the adults had to fast, including me sometimes, you know, three days, no food, no water. And it was time to give him some water. And his lips were so crusted over that part of his lip, like the crust, touched my finger. Like, you know, it, you know, I've given him the water. I remember backing up. Like at first I felt sorry for him as he was drinking it, but then when that, I thought, Instead of me feeling the empathy that I should have normally felt as a person, I was disgusted. I didn't want his lips to touch me. And sometimes, you know, thinking about it, I still feel it. I feel it because I still smell him. She's referring to Iman Harper in that instance. And um, 
Iman was the child of a um, teen pregnancy in Chicago, and somehow a, a member of the House of Prayer kind of persuaded the mother to let her take the child, you know, because she was a teen mother. And so she brought um, Iman, who they later renamed Moses, down to the property. And Anna was so excited about Moses, um, Iman or Moses. We'll just refer to him as Moses. And, um, you know, Joy was excited. The rest of, you know, everybody at the House of Prayer was excited to have this baby. And, you know, you don't think of a toddler being punished. You know, you, you wet the bed, you don't think of them being punished. But Iman would, you know, have um, the food and water um, withheld from him. And he's two or three years old. And Joy really, it, it was interesting to talk to her about as she, you know, made that morph of now being in the normal world. Because she was talking about at that time, when she would see Moses in the closet, she didn't necessarily see a a baby who was starving and, you know, was thirsty. She saw a baby that was gross, you know, his lips were cracked. And um, she, you know, just had that remorse now all of these years later that whenever that part, that crust of his lip touched her hand, she pulled her hand back, not because she was scared, but because she was kind of disgusted. And now all these years later, she says that is what haunts her. Um, she has this, you know, this vivid memory of how he looks and how he smells. And that was a lot of the punishment that was mostly for Moses. He would, you know, almost everybody would get um, beaten in the way of some lashes. Um, but Moses, how he ultimately died was in that closet just hours after Joy saw him for that last time. And um, documents show different uh, interviews with members. And it took a little while to get to this point where they finally described how Moses was basically disposed of. And um, one of the sisters there, or, you know, members, she found Iman in a hamper, actually, in the closet. So not just in a closet, but confined to a tiny clothes hamper. And um, she saw that he was dead, went and told Anna. And it just seems like kind of at that point, they might have panicked a little bit, took Moses, and this is what law enforcement says now, um, it took him out to a field not too far um, off the property and ended up burning his body. And that's what made this case a little hard for law enforcement in the very beginning because they, could, they didn't have a body or remains to find. Um, and they excavated the property and didn't find anything. But it was through all of those really brave survivors that ended up coming forward, you know, who could have kind of been involved in this. At the time, they didn't know any better. They, you know, followed Anna's orders, but they, you know, were granted immunity in this case. But they could also, you know, kind of be at fault for this, for listening to Anna's orders and burning the body. I think they're... they're uh, courage in this to come forward for, you know, doing the right thing was pretty remarkable. Jocelyn Howard says the experience of meeting and hearing from Joy Fluker and a young daughter was emotional and in some ways unexpected. Um, I was kind of expecting, you know, to dig into things, try and extract, you know, like in a very, uh, uh, calm way, you know, just some of this pain um, to be able to tell this story, but in a respectful way. And Joy was nothing but open about it. And it was kind of a roller coaster because you can see this love for her mom, but you also can see the pain that her mother caused that she just buried away for all of these years. And so it was kind of hard to navigate, you know, am I going to touch a nerve here? Has she been, you know, kind of masking this being strong? But I ultimately learned she is a very strong woman. She's able to tell her story now. Um, and um, I mean, I had about three hours talking with her and she just gave me what I asked for was completely open. And I think that openness is also what helped solve this case because she really did give law enforcement everything that they needed. It was a tumultuous relationship. I loved my mom, but it was tumultuous. I had you know, some animosity because of things I'd witnessed her do, um, but I still loved her. I mean, what she was talking about there is, um, it was right before she started talking about how she got to the point of turning her mom in. And what it sounds like, um, you know, Joy, of course, grew up in the house of prayer um, around this religion, around people who are following her mom. And she said that she used to, you know, see her mother as um, the voice of God. And the house of prayer started out as supposed to be a safe haven, you know, for people who had committed wrongdoings and to help change their lives around. But as people started idolizing her, other broken people, people who are also broken, they see, oh my God, she's such a holy woman and she's done all this for me. They, people began to look at you as the voice of God versus looking at God for yourself. They start looking at her as the voice of God. They're willing to lay down and take beatings and whippings and starvations and be in boxes and eat cow manure and everything because they love God so much. They just want to be pure and holy. And even though all that was the wrong way of going about it, their heart was right. As she got more exposed to the real world, she knew that her upbringing wasn't necessarily right. 
That feeling would eventually lead Joy Fluker to go to police and tell her story to turn her mom in. So she said, you know, I had a lot of animosity towards my mom. Um, you know, it was a on again, off again relationship. They would have some really severe fights, but it was the last fight that really just sent her over the edge. And what kind of happened there was um, she has two sons. Um, and her one son, she said, was he was a teen, kind of getting in with the wrong crowd, and you know she was getting on him, and um, he ended up kind of running away for a night, um, not the full night, but after school he never came home from school, and so um, from there she called Anna. Anna doesn't live too far away outside Atlanta, and she said, "Hey, have you seen?" And she said her son's name, and um, I guess the, the son was there with Anna, and so from there um, she went to go pick up her son at Anna's house, and her Anna said to her. Um, or she she overheard her saying to um, Joy's sons, you're being manipulated by Joy. And that's when Joy kind of saw this as, whoa, she's not being this overprotective grandmother. She is, you know, taking trying to take a hold of them, take my children from me and my children's trust. And she said at that moment, she didn't see her mom or loving grandmother. She saw Mother Anna taking control. And that's where things exploded. And um, some words were exchanged. And that's where she just blurts out, how can you tell me how to raise my kids when you killed two children? And um, she said she saw a look on her mom's face that she hasn't seen since the house of prayer. How can you tell me how to raise my kids when you kill two children? And after I said it out loud, I saw the look on her face, a look that I hadn't seen in years since we were at the house of prayer. And I know my mom. And that look let me know that all these flashbacks about Moses and feeling like she had killed him and all these thoughts were real. So it was really just that pain for all of those years um, that built up and she finally just kind of snapped and snapped in a good way because here we are today. Some survivors of the House of Prayer were unable to come forward and tell their stories, among them the young girl who was given a chemical bath at the hands of Anna Young. Yeah, and, and so this Nikki Nicholson, the, the girl who had that chemical bath that Anna Young gave her, um, Nikki actually died, unrelated to this. Uh, she, I believe, died from diabetes, but you know maybe she w could have been someone who would have been able to speak up about what happened as well. Um, her sister, when we interviewed her in 2017, she said, I remember my sister didn't look okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, Joy Fluker stepped up and, and said something, but it, again, this could have happened to so, so many more people. Whenever I first heard this in 2017, you know, you hear a toddler was killed and, um, you know, the cult leader had um, a lot, you know, was very abusive to children. Of course, that's terrible to hear. Um, but as a reporter, you get kind of used to hearing some of that stuff, not necessarily every day, but, you know, you can deal with hearing that. Um, but all of these, like three years later now, whenever I see what is now available in court documents and I was reading through every single case and, you know, they are, I read probably like at least 300 um, pages and documents of just these experiences. And I was doing it in such a short span of time, at least a month, to process all of that. And I had nightmares. I think working on it for such a short period of time and reading that every night, um, it took a toll on me. I had nightmares, but I, that makes me just, it makes me feel even more remorse and you know, thinking about the victims, if just reading these documents has that effect on me, I cannot imagine what they have even as adults now, 40 years later. The lifelong sentence, as Joy Fluker describes the memories that still flood back, may never end for her and the other survivors of the House of Prayer. And maybe Anna Young's sentencing to 30 years behind bars gave them some satisfaction. But as it turns out, Anna Young would spend only 42 days in federal prison after being convicted earlier this year. Convicted killer and ex-cult leader Anna Young has died. The Marietta woman led the House of Prayer cult in Florida. A judge sentenced her to 30 years in prison for the deaths of two toddlers in the 1980s. Young had been in prison just 42 days before her death. Joy Fluker, Young's daughter, says Young was in the ICU on oxygen Monday night. This is what Fluker had to say about her experience when we spoke with her earlier this year. Those are things I can't live with because I feel like if I live with those, then I'm just as guilty. This is what I'm ashamed of. This is... This is this is my life sentence. She had a life and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Hune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is the yellow car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson here with Reed Redman and Spencer Brudig. Even in the 30 minutes that we've had here uh, talking about this story, we scratched the surface in a way. Yeah, Will, you know, it's an understatement to say that it's hard to listen to these stories. But there is clearly, for, for some of these survivors, power in being able to share their stories. And not only their stories, but to have the opportunity to share the stories of the two children who died. 
Can you give us a little more of an overview of how big this operation or cult or whatever we want to call it was? How many people were following Anna Young? This was not a large organization. You know, people numbered in the dozens, if you will. Like, this is not like hundreds of followers. Um, you know, you have to assume that she had a home in Florida that wasn't, you know, it wasn't a massive property. It was large enough that they could keep, you know, children and their parents and, you know, followers there day and night. But, um, you know, this was not a huge group. You know, one of the things I just wanted to um, kind of color commentate for our listeners is looking at photos and video of, of driving down the kind of dead palm frond driveway. It's a dirt road leading up to the house. It is exactly what I would expect a um, a place where something like this would go down. I mean, it is a, a pretty creepy drive. I couldn't believe that when I saw that, that, you know, I, I didn't expect it to look like that. And then when you see videos and, and, and uh, photographs of it, you're like, man, this is... This is a place where a lot of terror happened, and it, it really does look like it, too. And we should maybe clarify, too, because House of Prayer is a common name for churches around the country, that this wasn't part of a network of churches or anything like that. It was it was independently run by Anna Young, right? Yeah, very good point. Uh, this was her organization, not connected to any others that are currently out there that we're aware of. All right, be sure to check out our Facebook group, Inside the Crime Vault, if you'd like to talk about the story and others we are covering here on True Crime Chronicles. Thanks to Reed Redmond and Spencer Brudig, and we will be back next week with a new case and a new story.